Hey, good morning. It's Sabine. It is Wednesday, October 6th. It is the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. If we go to the Equilux Solar Calendar, we can see that October 6th is the 22nd of Tishri, the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was at the Feast of Tabernacles that the light of the world, Jesus, took his place amongst the four amazingly great candlesticks which lit the entire city. And he declared himself to be the light of the world, the fountain of living water, and even the I Am. This day is so beautifully rich in promise. I'm going to dive into it right away and try to keep it short because I believe time is short too. And if you desire to, there is lots more to, to um, read and listen to uh, in the article. And I'm going to link the article in the description box, as always, if you want to do a deep dive into this, this beautiful day. So let's start. October 6th, the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the day that Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. A division of the people follows. He delivers the woman that was said to have been caught in adultery. The heavens are in perfect sync, with Venus still at the altar of redemption and the moon hidden in the glory of the sun. The woman is entirely hidden in the glory of the sun, just like this display of Jesus standing in the midst of the four candlesticks. October 6th, Tishri 22, the great day on the Equilux solar calendar, known also as the day of solemn assembly, or Shemini Atzeret in Hebrew. It's a prophetically very rich and promising day. We read about with hindsight in Solomon's assembly, concluding tabernacles in 1 Kings. And we read about it in forward time, forward in prophetic time, through the eyes of John who in the book of Revelation sees an innumerable multitude of glorified tribulation saints standing before the throne of the Lamb on the last great day of tabernacles, Revelation 7, 9. Like John the bright type next to Jesus in the throne room, Revelation 4, the darkened moon bride conjuncts with the sun today in Virgo, a little after midday after which the sun sets exactly at 18, 18. There's a hidden 666 encoded. This is the astronomical new moon phase, which is not the same as the biblical new moon, because that is the sighting of the first sliver. And that is not expected until October 7th. If the moon is not sighted, the new month will start by default on the next day. So today is the astronomical new moon. The moon is dark and hidden in the sun's glare, or rather covered by the sun's glory. There's another planet that is covered by the sun's glory. Mars, associated with war, and the archangel Michael standing up, is hidden in the sun's glare and invisible all of this month. In John 7, we find the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles to be the day when Jesus stands up and cries out publicly, after first having attended that feast in secret, and then to start teaching in the middle of it, according to the appointed time of, on his calendar, which was later than that the Jewish uh, leadership, the religious rulers had instructed. And I understand that the calendar that Jesus and John were referring to was the Equilar solar-based calendar. Jesus speaks about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and he manifests that he is the man with the water jar, who will lead his disciples to the heavenly upper room, where he would become their eternal bridegroom. So on this day, the light of the world has taken his rightful place among the midst of the four candelabras, as in our time the October sun covers Virgo in its glorious light, hiding the moon bright within its covering. 
The division amongst the crowd after Jesus stands up and cries resonates with the rapture which is also going to be a manifest division amongst believers, clarifying who belongs to either of the faith of the groups, the faithful bride who will be taken with the innocent in Christ, the lukewarm, or the unsaved. Only overcoming bridal believers and the innocent who are safe in Christ, children and the feeble-minded who cannot make a decision for him, will be taken in the first departure counted worthy to escape all things. The lukewarm will be left to develop enduring faith while enduring tribulation with unbelievers. As a parallel, we expect Jesus to stand up from his throne in heaven to meet us in the air halfway. As the bride and the remnant out of the redeemed woman caught in adultery. She had been set apart, has now become an overcomer by faith, refashioned by the Spirit and the Word into the Lord's image, having gone out into the harvest fields to meet her groom with her lamp lit, despite the spiritual darkness, the same darkness we are experiencing right now. The rapture will be a manifest division, glorifying our Lord. October 7th, an inner conviction and a public execution of judgment by the declared I am and light of the world is following today. So this takes place in the early hours of tomorrow. Simcha Torah, rejoicing in the Torah. Then in John 8, we read that Jesus came to the temple from his communion with the Father at the Mount of Olives at dawn. Just like Sirius, the bright and morning star, the eye of the hawk, the prince of peace, the brightest star in our firmament in this season catches the eyes of those waking early. We read about his solemn judgment by inner conviction of those operating in a Pharisaic religious spirit, those that hold judgment against the brethren, the bright type in particular, and the extension of grace and deliverance Jesus gives to the woman who is claimed to be caught in adultery. Subsequently, Jesus declares himself as the light of the world amidst the huge temple candlesticks, the candelabras, in the forecourt of the women. Jesus reveals he is the author of true judgment, the Son of Man, and the I Am. These declarations result in misunderstanding in some, accusations in other, especially of his presumed illegitimacy, and great opposition by the Pharisees and high priests, targeting not only his messages and deeds, but his very identity and threatening his life. And under the mounting threat of being stoned, Jesus disappears from their midst. His time to be seized had not yet come. Judgment is rendered on that morning after the great day. We commemorate that judgment on October 7th, tomorrow morning, on the Equilux Solar Calendar. While Jesus is seated, he writes in the sand, like he once wrote, the law unto stone and into people's hearts. As he wrote his warnings on King Nebuchadnezzar's wall, and he writes his signs in appointed times and his warnings on the blackboard of heaven for us today, which convict the accusers from within. The engraving of the earth, which he does by his finger in the sand, if you go into the Strong's, you can read additional meaning to the writing in the sand as being an engraving of the earth. That may point to the earth being marked for judgment and shaking violently. Just like the annual solar eclipses over the U.S., the past one and the coming one make an X mark over the nation. Jesus, the living Torah, the people should rejoice in on this day. He had assumed his rightful position of authority in the temple. He touched people's hearts. He moved their conscience, but most didn't recognize him or the authority vested in him to either extend grace to him, to them, but also the given ability and authority to judge them. Most were unaware or blind to their desperate need 
for his true judgment and deliverance. And then he stands up in verse 7, speaking into the innermost, the standard of eligibility to throw the first stone of judgment. Only he is able to fulfill. All who stand convicted retreat from senior, the ones most sin laden, to the young ones. And he stands before the woman who is brought before him to both ensnare her and him. And after the accusers have left, he delivers her. She addresses him reverently as his Lord, as Lord. And I believe that is a beautiful sign of her acknowledging him, not just for his grace, but also for his Lordship. The word used for raising up his body after engraving the earth is striking and resonates with him lifting up his spiritual body someday soon as well. So as I was reading these verses, I suddenly found that by him lifting himself up, it may mean that he's going to lift us up because we are his body, we are in him. Empowered and delivered by her Lord, the woman is equipped to overcome and heed his commands to go and sin no more. The word used for lifting up his body is anakupto. That means a raising, a lifting oneself up. That word is so rich with rapture. <laughs> He states that those that disbelieve and reject him, that soon they will seek him also, but not find him. And unless they turn to him in belief, they will die in their sins. And out, as outside of him, there is no salvation. In like manner, his body of faithful believers and the innocent kept safe in him will shortly be gone to where they cannot go. His own will be taken to heaven. And as he entered into the temple, we, by him, will enter into the Father's house. From the perspective of the left behind, we will be gone, as by a thief. Among the Pharisees, Nicodemus starts seeing the light. He stands up for truth, soliciting ridicule and disdain from his peers. So, it comes at a great cost. A similar description would befit many unbelieving and self-willed in our days. While we see the Lord's light of truth starting to shine amidst those who step out in faith toward him for the first time, despite fierce opposition and having counted the cost, we can see the Lord waking up many, many unsaved at this time. I once wrote an article about that pivotal morning court scene in this blog post, link below, focuses on the woman caught in adultery in particular, the bride type. It's especially interesting to read what active role the witnesses play in this court session and how Jesus goes by the law of the Lord and is not ensnared by the Pharisees who want to both condemn the woman and judge him. In our time, the expected second fulfillment I understand this scene to foretell a transition from the initial extended grace to active judgment of those who operate in a religious spirit of judgment, as well as condemnation of those willfully remaining in spiritual adultery and lukewarmness. Kick started with the judgment of the U.S. as Babylon's daughter, the harlot nation, who relish in sin and bring forth fruits of darkness Despite the extended grace, the ample warnings and additional time given to repent and turn and bring forth godly fruit, in line with the parable of the barren fig tree, believers among them who will partake in her judgment belong to the five reproved and rebuked churches of Revelation 1, 1 to 3, who have not heeded Jesus' instruction to come out, to repent, turn back to him, Follow him in faith, love, and obedience, just like those in the churches of Philadelphia, the brotherly love, and Smyrna, the persecuted, who make up the bride. In the next video, I'm going to continue with this narrative and the 
celestial signs for today and tomorrow.